on the forums and on social media. I'm joined today by Kevin Scott, one of the authors of the High Republic uh, group of stories. He's done a lot of other work with Star Wars before in the past, but we're going to talk about the High Republic today and maybe a few other things. So thank you so, so much for joining us today, Kevin. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Um, right. So I guess to get started overall with uh, everything for Rebel Reads, to get started for you, what would you say is like your first like memory for Star Wars as a kid or your favorite Star Wars memory? I think my first memory, I don't know, I've talked about this before, but I, I started reading the comics before I saw the films. Um, and so over here, we had something called Star Wars Weekly, which reprinted the old original Marvel run. Um, every week, they sort of chopped it up into little bits and then added anything Marvel had that was remotely Star Wars at the back. So for a long time, it was Star Lord um, because mm -hmm. Star. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, that was my introdu introduction to it. Um, I remember getting my first toy before knowing who Ben Kenobi was, and it was the, uh, the Obi-Wan figure. And I got it for Christmas and I remember opening it up and looking at my grandma going, gee, thanks. That's a old man. Brilliant. <laughs> And then found out very soon after who he was um, and got very excited then. But yeah, so it's the, I think the first film I saw was Empire in the cinema um, because I was a little bit too young for, for the first first one. But um, yeah, I, I, by the time I, I saw that, um, I'd become a fan through the comics. Although I was very upset that Jackson wasn't in, that, in Empire Strikes Back. So I you, knew Jackson was going to come up very early know, on in this conversation. I, I now I'm trying to get them into, him, him into conversation right from the off because people <laughs> expect it um lucasfilm expects it everyone expects it but um but it's true I, I remember sitting down there thinking any minute now he's going to run around that corner on cloud city and he didn't but now we know now he does anyway. <laughs> yeah in um in my little like research just prepping to like chat with you today i was looking up all of the works that you've done for star wars so far and i didn't realize you've actually written a good handful about jackson already um for yeah. Star Wars and like how did that like all come about like pretty much taking like one of your favorite characters and translating it at least just to comics and books I think it was a case of I I just started talking about him a lot <laughs> um and, and sort of like pitched or you know loosely pitched I'd love to do a Jackson story well, I know we're never going to be able to do it um and then when Star Wars Adventures started and it was obviously aimed at sort of a, I mean it's People called it a kids' comic, but it's aimed, it's a family comic. That was the idea of it. Yeah. Um, and so we were looking at characters we could focus on, and, and they came to me and said, "You know, you've always wanted to write that Jackson story. Well, this could be the spot because it's a big green bunny. You know, kids yeah. love it. They'll be re parents reading it with their kids, and they know some of the backstory maybe. And if they didn't, it's a big green bunny. Um, and so it was only supposed to be a backup story in one of the, in the first annual, um, and it went bonkers and everyone loved him um as i knew they would um and then since then he's been back every year for annuals and now yeah he's short stories he's in um vader's castle the last series of vader's castle which is coming yeah. up in this place this month um and so yeah i can't quite believe that i have been able to someone said to me you've written jackson more than anyone else on the planet i was like, i'm not sure that's a good thing but yes i <laughs> have um but you know i i, I try and treat him carefully and treat him like a real character i mean yeah he's a bit of a because he is points. he was but real yeah, for you now he's exactly, real for definitely for me he was you know he, for me there was no difference between him and the big fish that was in charge of the spaceships you know so <laughs> i couldn't you know as a 10 year old or whatever i couldn't see the difference at, at all um and so yeah i mean i think you you treat him he, he takes everything um, with a with a grain of salt when he's in the middle of a story, and I think as long as you treat him that he has actually got wants and needs, like just like any other character, he can work as much as any other character in Star Wars. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I I always love how all of our authors in Star Wars seem to find like the one character that they absolutely adore, and they're just like, this is the one. We we gotta put them everywhere, and we have to try and do it. And I love to see it, and I love to see that you guys get to create um, your favorites as well, not just make our future favorites, but make what you want to make essentially. Yeah. Um, let me see. So let me get back on track. Sorry for the, the Jackson uh, interlude there. Yeah, but um, Every conversation just swerves into Jackson. <laughs> it's good. I love it. For me personally, it's always a side on Ithano. He's, he's always the one that comes up in conversation for me. Same deal. He has a Star Wars Adventures comic now. He's in one short story. He's a background yeah. character, but like same vibe here. Um, yeah. Let me see. So before the High Republic, you had written a few Star Wars stories before. Um, 
pretty much like how did you get involved overall with writing for Star Wars in general? Well, I was writing for a series of books um, based on the Skylanders game, um, which was a, a game when you used to put the figures on, on the board mm -hmm. that appeared in the, in the show. So I wrote the majority of the books based on that uh, based on that game. Um, and they were sort of aimed at sort of yeah, nine to 10 year olds and they were, they were short little 15,000 word books. Um, and around that time, Egmont over here in the UK had the rights to do a, a similar kind of series, but for Star Wars, but it was before Force Awakens came out. Um, mm -hmm. So we couldn't use, they couldn't use any of the, the characters from the sequel trilogy. They didn't want to necessarily use the characters from the original trilogy or the prequel trilogy. So they, kept, they were given the chance to come up with brand new, a brand new part of Star Wars, a brand new sort of corner of the galaxy set just, just after the fall of the Republic and the early days of the Empire. Um, and they, they put feelers out for people who could write these. And one of them, one of the editors came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in writing a little sample piece, you know, a little audition piece with them. Um, and all we had at that point were the characters' names and a basic idea of the story. Um, and so I wrote this chapter. I mean, obviously I wanted the job. I, I was being very professional and going, oh yeah, that'll be fine. But obviously screaming inside. Yeah. Um, wrote this piece um, and that's one of the, it, a version of it is the, the opening chapter of the first adventures in Wild Space books, which was the series that came out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think came out and did a, you know, made a big splash over here in the UK. I don't think it, it was so popular in the States, but I think it was sort of, it came, it came out a bit later and it was sort of lost in all the Rebels kind of thing. It was, it was linked to Rebels in a small degree. Um, but yeah, that was my intro into it. And, and through that went to, Star Wars Celebration in London, met with the guys at, at publishing, um, and it went from there, really. And and I was working on a couple of things behind the scenes, and then Star Wars Adventures launched, and, and I was asked to pitch for the first stories, and it sort of went from that point. Yeah. I, got, I gotta say, I gotta ask this one in general, up front already. Um, you've written a lot of audio dramas in the past, and that's something yeah. that I find absolutely awesome in the first place, and most notably outside of Star Wars, I would say Doctor Who is what our viewers here would like know most about. Um, was an audio drama always on the roadmap for the High Republic, or was that something that you pushed for? Um, I don't know. Well, it might have been for the High Republic by the time we'd already done Dooku, Jedi right. Law, and the Doctor Aphra um, audio as well. When I first started working in Star Wars, my background is audio drama originally i've been writing that for about 20 years and we have a big audio drama tradition over here i mean it never really went away i mean i love some of the old school radio dramas from the states mm -hmm. you know, shadows the adventures of superman i mean adventures of superman is incredible so much superman comes from that radio show um and i love that but we whereas american sort of drama went completely to television radio drama carried on over here and we have a national yeah. radio station that still has a radio play of the day. Um, it has a soap opera that's been running for like 50, 60 years or whatever. Um, so yeah, we, we have a real tradition. I know it didn't really exist um, in the US until podcasts sort of came back and have brought it back and places are like audible. So I started again sort of like talking about it and, and it was one of those things that I think people were, were discussing within Lucasfilm, but it hadn't, you know, they didn't really know how, how to do it or where to do it. Um, and so when the idea came up to trial it with Dooku, um, mm -hmm. what became Dooku Jedi Lost, um, they came to me because I'd already been talking to them. It wasn't a definite pitch I'd been making to them. It was just like, look, this is a cool thing. And as it grows in popularity, Star Wars should be there at the forefront of it. Um, right. And so, yeah, and so I was really pleased to be, um, I was working, I was, I was offered it as we were all leaving from the first week at Skywalker Ranch. Um, working on the, what became the High Republic. Um, so it's also very linked up in my mind. And of course, Claudia was writing um, Master and Apprentice at the same time. So we were mm -hmm. able to link up. Um, right, yeah. In, you know, as we were also working together on the High Republic. So that was great. Um, so I think by the time that Duca came out and was a success and Afro had followed, I think there was always plans that there would be a audio aspect of the High Republic. And when I first put my first proposal together because all five of us made a proposal of what project luminous should be mm -hmm. i know audio was was a part of that and I, I sort of listed all the different formats and audio was definitely there um so yeah i think by that point we'd we'd all sort of realized what we could do with audio and, and wanted to push it a little bit more with high republic as well um with tempest runner yeah 
it's it's funny like looking into like what star wars is always like pushing the limit of technology in general with the films and the tv shows and it's funny looking back at it that radio is pretty much like how we started with like this kind of like storytelling and then star wars never really did that aside from a few like ones with the original cast and like i'm the 80s and yeah. all that but, but um it's funny the, that it's, sorry i was gonna got say that, yeah, there, <laughs> the, there's the original radio um yeah play, which translate the the, for the first three movies. And then there are also um, some legends, uh, expanded right. universe um, yeah. as well. But again, it's I think it's because the market wasn't really there, you know, and it hasn't been until recently. So, and yeah. it's still, when we were promoting Dooku, it was still promoted as an audio book, which was very odd then when people were going, well, hang on, it's got loads of voices in it. Um, and so I remember the celebration where we, before it came out, um, must be Chicago, it was, I was having to explain what audio drama was to people. because so, I, you know, I spent a lot of time on the audio stand um, because it's at such a passion of mine and people were listening to clips of it and they just, they'd never really heard anything like it. Yeah. Um, whereas for me, I was going, well, this is what we have all the time at home. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely something I think people are now getting more used to. So again, with Thomas Running, we could lose the narration and just go, you know, full, full drama. Um, but I think there's there's a lot we can do with it, and there's still a long a long way to go. Right. I mean, I think that one of like my biggest wishes, and like in conversations with friends as well, with everything we've had releases for the higher public, is more um, like music and original music with like the dramas and whatnot. Because like I have been entranced by rec punk since the very beginning. I don't even know what it sounds like, but I I just really want to know what it sounds like, yeah. and. I, I just love everything about it. And so like uh, to switch gears to Tempest Runner, since we're still kind of on it, um, I've always been like, I, I read the books myself. I don't listen to the audiobooks. And then like a, a few of my other friends will be like, hey, I heard it with this. And like, they love like the way Mark Thompson narrates it. And I'm like, that's not how I thought Mark on Rowe was going to yeah. sound like, but it's still good. And I think that it's just really interesting with Tempest Runner now. Um, there's a big reveal. Okay, so spoilers to people who haven't listened to Tempest Runner yet. Um, there's a big reveal within the first act with Panetta, obviously, and that was kind of a surprise to me, but to audiobook listeners, it wasn't a surprise at all. Like, did you anticipate that happening? Well, I knew it would, if people have heard Mark, um, Mark form as, I mean, he does perform, that's the thing about Mark, they're not just readings, you know. Right, they're, yeah. They're right into all their characters. So I knew there was going to be an element that some people would know and some people wouldn't. Um, but I think that's fun, and I think for a lot of people, you know, it puts it means they know something more than the people in the scenes. So yeah. in those early scenes where Pan's talking to the Nile in the in the in the tap bar, um, yeah, we know if, if you re if you recognise the voice, you know who he's talking to, and you know the danger that that guy's in. Right. Um, and also, you probably, you know, probably think, well, hang on a minute. Last time we saw Pan, he wasn't in a very good state, and and then he really ends up in, not in a very good state in Temple Runner. Um, and yeah, so it was. There was a slight concern. I didn't know how much um, reverb they were going to put on the fact that he was wearing a helmet and he was wearing a respirator. Yeah. And so I didn't know at that point. Um, but I, I, th I thought it was a gamble worth playing with because there would also be a massive part of the audience who wouldn't know about it. Um, right. And if and when we have a script book out, we're going to have to think about how we mark up that part of the text because mysterious master. Yeah, the script says <laughs> pan, which sort of blows it. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, um, those kind of things are always tricky to try and put off. I think we did it, um, but um, hopefully for those who did realize it, it added to the enjoyment of the scene. It was, it was successful because like the way that it was written, like I picked it up, like who it was, like based on like the clues he was dropping. And so like that made sense from the writing side, but like for like, the voice side, like the few people that like, oh, listen to the audiobook only, they immediately like knew it was Pan. And I'm like, oh, well, okay, well it was a reveal, but... It was still overall well received. Um, let me double check my questions. We've we gotten like off track, but like stayed on track at the same time. I just gotta say. Um, let me go back a little bit. So, in general, for the higher public, for for those who are watching this, who might not know what the heck we're talking about, um, how would you explain the higher public to them in just like a couple sentences? So the High Republic is a new era in Star Wars storytelling. It's set around 200 years before the prequels, um, and it's an area that's never really been explored, um, either in canon or legends. Um, and, and it's best summed up, hopefully, by that moment where Obi-Wan first describes 
what the galaxy used to be like to Luke in, in A New Hope. Um, and that moment when you hear him talk about, you know, the Jedi being the peacekeepers for generations and a more elegant age and a more elegant weapon for a more civilized age. And, and you want to see that point. You want to see what the Jedi are like. And I mean, I've always loved that speech because before we had the Clone Wars, there was the mention of the Clone Wars and you're like, what's the Clone Wars? What's and that? there are so many things. Um, I dropped into that conversation that would just have history and weight because of the way that Obi-Wan talks about them. Um, and yeah, for all of us, when we were putting together what Project Luminous could be, because at the point it was never meant to be the High Republic, it was just mm -hmm. one of the ideas that came up. Um, we all wanted to know what it was like to be a Jedi at that time, before the prequels, before the fall of the Jedi, before the, you know, before Darth Sidious just started his work in the background to try and pull everything down. What was that golden age like? So that's what the High Republic should be, at, at the beginning anyway. Things have yeah. taken a turn for the worst, <laughs> as it always was going to, you know. What would um, you say so far um, with phase one of the High Republic, what, have, what would you say so far has been your personal favorite piece of it so far, either that you have written and then what you personally haven't written? Um, can I say something that's not out yet? <laughs> no, so, I don't think we're allowed to do, talk about that. <laughs> uh, so phase one, so everything that's come out so far. <laughs> it's really tough because the most exciting thing I've read is Claudia's new novel, which comes in the beginning later on in the year. But I can say that. I'm not giving yeah. any details what's in it. Um, that was a little because, hype. <laughs> because that's the culmination of, of phase one, you know, um, that and the stories around it. So um, I think, to be honest, one of the most exciting things for me has been to see the reaction because we had no idea if it was going to work. Um, you know, and then we launched it and then there was a little pandemic that sort of like screwed everything up. Mm -hmm. um, literally the week I was in LA l l launching it with the other guys, when I flew out, there didn't seem to be a problem with COVID. And by the time I flew back two weeks later, everyone was wearing masks and we were in lockdown within weeks. Yeah. So obviously we had all that, um, we had the delay. There was a lot, you know, like always in Star Wars, there was a lot of chatter about it online. People weren't sure. Some people loved the idea. Some people hated the idea. So you never know when, how it's going to land. And we hoped it would land well. Um, and to start seeing from the moment that we started showing concept art, people reacting to some of the characters. I think when, for me personally, when Skier was first re um, released, that artwork of him, um, and people started talking about they're going to start cosplaying him and what's the, imagining what he's like. And then I thought, we might actually have something here. You know, that, that's the all there was was the picture of him and people were responding to it the first you know the, the sort of some of the early art of Ava people were responding to her and so to see it land afterwards um and yes there are always going to be people who don't like things because that's life and there has to be people who don't like things because we can't all like the same stuff um but the general response to it has been incredible and the, the fact that people have latched on to different characters is what what I've loved about it so Part of the idea was that there'll be all these different stories being told. And yes, if you read them all, there's one big story, but hopefully you could pick up the, the part of the story you want and focus on the characters you want. Um, and again, there was this big thing at the beginning that people thought it was all about Ava. And I was like, no, she's just one of the characters. She's right. just part of the cast. Um, and there'll be other, if you don't like Ava, there will be other characters you will. Um, that was the hope. And it seemed to work like that, you know, it seemed, it seemed to have, people have found characters that they get really invested in and they follow through and they get very angry then when you do things to them. Um, that always happens though. <laughs> that always happens. But yeah, so that to, for me has been the joy of it. Um, seeing people, you know, because it, it hasn't got a lot of links to you know, a lot of the stuff that's come for it. It's hopefully recognizably the Republic. Um, hopefully the Jedi are recognizable as Jedi. But other than Yoda and a few other long-lived Jedi from the council. Um, that's pretty much it. These are all brand new characters and we've only really been living with them. Well, we've been living with them for years, but the, it's only been out since January. And so yeah. the, the amount of investment people already have in it has been staggering to watch. Um, so yeah, I think that's the most exciting thing for me that people have taken these characters into their hearts and they're worried about them. They're worried for them. Um, they're excited to see where it's gonna go. And we see, we see art, we see people cosplaying. And that's just, that's amazing. When you've spent a couple of years developing this new era, um, to see people react like that is phenomenal and heartwarming.
Yeah, I, I absolutely love how there's pretty much been like an entire like subgroup of a really close knit community with the entire like higher public like fandom within the Star Wars community. Um, a lot of it is like based on like Twitter and it's absolutely insane like seeing everyone just like react like all of the time when a new release comes out and just seeing all of the joy from it. And that that is really what it is because you 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 guys have made so much content being released within the past year for just one era and it's a lot and and we still want more and um additionally i know i speak on behalf of the entire rebel legion here in which we want more reference photos of all of those costumes um i know that's out of your hands but we want those photos just <laughs> we're all yeah. we're all jameson over here wanting those photos i'll tell you a secret justina island whenever she writes comics um and there are some comics coming from her um She's constantly on the artist, asking the artist to turn the characters around a bit so that so we can, That's so what we need. can see. Um, and I, but again, the fact that we've got so much art for a let's face it, a book series, and you know, mm -hmm. there was always going to be comic art, but the fact that Disney have been having artists working on character designs for these, for, you know, that doesn't happen. That's not the norm. Um, and it's amazing to see the fact that the art department have got so behind it. Um, and we saw, I've seen a load of art in the last week for characters, secondary, tertiary characters from upcoming books, but you know, Disney are, are, and Lucasfilm are committed to actually say, this is what the era looks like. Um, and that's been great to see. And it's been really inspirational as well, because I've been shocked by some of what the characters look like. And so you start working that into how you write them. Um, and like, cause I come from comics, um, when you work with an artist all the time and you see their interpretation and that then informs the storytelling. We're doing that with the books as well as art's coming through. We're, we're, we're picking up on some of the little details that the artists are putting in. Um, and it's helping make it feel like as an era, there is this, this wider group of creatives working on it that we can, when we have moments where you're just going, I have to do the story, I've got to get the got deadline coming, I've got to get the words out that's when you can start flicking through the art deck and you start getting excited again because you're going, oh, that's what it looks like. This is cool. Um, and so we get as much out of that as I think other people do as well. Yeah. Um, to jump back a moment, you mentioned like you saw art about newer characters and like secondary characters. And so I'm not going to ask specifics about new stuff, but in something that's already come out though. Um, so in The Rising Storm, there is a tall, hang on, I've written it down, a tile or tie. Um, he yes. was a Udidas. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's like a, like a bird type creature who kind of is a little bit force sensitive. And so overall, like the question I have, this was from one of my friends, Kendra. Um, might we see more of this in the future or learn more about like the history with um, populations that can like use the force, but they're not necessarily Jedi? Or what, what are you expecting to like kind of like pull more from like legends essentially to put into the High Republic? I'd love to explore more of that, of that stuff because I, I've never believed that the Jedi are it when it comes to the force, you can't believe that. And I think there are so many stories yet to be told of what the emperor was doing to everyone else as well, because he obviously focused on the Jedi who were at the top of the food chain, but mm -hmm. there would have been, you know, we already know the Night Sisters, you know, and various other people that they were out there. And of course, it's something that the EU explored quite a lot. Um, so while I can't talk about what's coming, I, I, it's something that I personally I'm very interested in and anyone who reads my stuff knows that I do like to try and pull the most obscure things from the EU and sprinkle them in um, and and that that species was definitely a, uh, a species I wanted to use at some point I would love to develop more um, and when I was writing that there's an entire passage that's not in the book um, which explains more about how that species in sort of the new canon ended up being where they are um, and why they're on the planet and there's some hints in the rising storm of what happened. Um, but yeah. I, wrote, I got carried away and wrote this little mini history. There is a, <laughs> um, they have a, a thing in story group when they try and um, they say that they think I've got a book of species that haven't been mentioned for a while. And it's pretty <laughs> much true. I mean, I do have a notepad that's full of like, I'd love to use that one and that one and that one because it's all there. And it's, you know, it's, it's a resource which I think we can totally use to make the galaxy feel bigger. Um, yeah. You know, that's one thing when you're writing something like this there's a danger the galaxy starts to feel small because characters have to meet each other and you know and, and they know each other because you need those links between the books so for me personally the way to make it feel bigger is the fact that there are hundreds of planets out there and this, this is at a point where some of them are in the republic and some aren't and so you've got all these this ability to create new which is always brilliant but also to delve into 
you know, all those years of creativity. And I grew up reading those books. Um, I grew up reading the comics, especially because it was comics were always where I was with Star Wars. Um, and I want to pay tribute to a lot of that as well, you know, to those people, those creators who created all these amazing mm -hmm. characters and all these amazing speeches and planets um, and bring it into the story wherever I can. And most of the time, Story Group are absolutely 100% behind it. Sometimes the only reason I can't and I suggest things is A, because they say I can't canonize everything in the Ewok movies, which I think <laughs> is a lie. Um, and, and B, because things are happening elsewhere. And so, um, so yeah, they, they know exactly how I work. And, and I never try and sneak stuff in. I flag it and I say, as in, I give reference points. And so I give them the chance to say, what do you think you're doing now, Scott? Um, uh, but yeah, it's definitely something that I, I'm playing in Star Wars. And so I want it to be Star Wars. And so that's why I go back to all those texts. That's good. That's that's the dream. That's just perfect. I, I love it. Um, we're slightly running out of time, so I have a couple more things left, but I think in general uh, here, you've written in almost every era of Star Wars, so from the High Republic to a few actual sequel trilogy things and whatnot, kids stuff, but it's there. Um, what would you say, It's the answer is probably going to be the High Republic, but what has been your favorite era that you've written in for Star Wars? Oh, it's really tough because, it, yeah, I mean, the High Republic is obviously special to me. I always get a thrill writing anything in the original trilogy because that was, they were my it was my they were my heroes you know so it whenever I get a chance to write Han I will jump at the chance it's terrifying to write Han but I love it so much Chewie um those two especially I'll come back to I have written a lot more in the prequel trilogy than I originally thought I would and enjoyed it a lot more than I originally thought now I have a complicated history with the prequels because I'm of that age where it, you know I was being the angry fan at one point mm -hmm. um and I now have a very different relationship with them because of the Clone Wars, mainly, and because of Rebels, and because of my daughters. Um, and I, I remember, through my daughters, I saw those films with different eyes to when I was an angry kid going, well, not so much a kid going, but this can't be Star Wars. <laughs> um, and so I've, I've really tried to embrace it, and I, I now love writing um, in that era as well. So I mean, I've been very lucky. I haven't written as much in the sequel era than I'd like to. Um, a little, bit, a little comics. yeah a little bit but um and uh, you know, some of the choose your own adventure books and things um but i'd love to write more there and to be honest i'd like to write beyond that point i think a lot of us would because we want to know yeah. what happens next we all want to know what happens next uh, that's that's always it what happens next and you couldn't answer that yourself so that's why the higher public went back <laughs> yeah um yeah. Okay, my last little bit, I'm going to call it the Tempest round. It's essentially a lightning round. I thought it was okay. cute. Go He's Tempest. So, um, all right, so pick one or the other. I'm going to throw out a bunch of them. Ready? Uh, figure in Dan in the model nodes or Max Rebo? Max Rebo. Max Rebo, got it. Uh, Jedi or Nihil? Oh, Jedi, definitely. That's okay. more stylish. All right, all right. Uh, clone Troopers or Storm Troopers? Storm Troopers. Mm. Uh, X-Wing or TIE Fighter? TIE Fighter, just they look cooler. And there's some, I, I get very, this isn't a quick answer. I get very excited when you see the different variations of, of, of TIE Fighters. I love TIE Fighters. That's variants. true, yeah. Um, I have my favorite one is from <laughs> um, Dark Empire, which is the TIE Crawler. Yeah. I recanonized oh, in a two an adventure book because it's a TIE that's a tank. What's not to love <laughs> about that? Um, so yeah, always TIEs. I love that. Uh, one more. Uh, the Old Republic or the High Republic? No, I'm not. I can't answer that. I really can't answer that. I'm no. I refuse oh? both. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll do one the, last. I love one. the Old Republic, but the High Republic is my baby. Fair. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Last one. This one's very serious. Very serious. Uh, geode or geode? <laughs> Always geode. <laughs> Always geode. Yeah. Perfect. Um. Well, yeah, that's that's the all majority of the questions that I have. I have a lot more to say, but we have a running out of time, unfortunately. So I want to thank you so much, Kevin, for joining the Rebel Legion uh, stream for Rebel Reads this year. Uh, where can everybody find you on social media if they want to reconnect with you or just follow and see your works? Um, it's probably let's go to my website, kevinscott.com, or find me on Twitter at Kevin Scott. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then thank you everyone for watching this so far. My name has been Jamie. I'm a member of Alderaan Base and thank you so much for watching Rebel Reads.